Good morning. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, the organizers of the Science Day program at RRI for uh, including me in that program. And uh, also, I feel honored to be in the role that I am. And uh, I think uh, you know I'm looking forward to this uh, stint I will have uh, as the director of uh, Raman Research Institute. I. I am a cosmologist uh, and uh, so my broad thing would be gravitation and cosmology and I would like to narrate stories to young people to tell you what we have achieved in the last century and you know in that sense uh, I although I work on that uh, on a daily basis so sometimes you get kind of slightly immune to the excitement or you know but uh, Nevertheless, whenever I'm sitting on my own during a weekend, it never ceases to amaze me how much we have understood about, the, about our universe, and particularly in the last three, four decades. You know, and I would like to convey that excitement to you. Okay, so let me begin with this picture here. This sort of is, shows you the splendor of the skies. I mean, this is why human uh, beings from right from the beginning have always wondered, you know, where are we, what are these, and you know, what's our place in the universe. It's, you know, it has been a quest as old as humanity. And uh, this picture is by a very well-known uh, photographer, astrophotographer, but actually he's a practicing um, astronomer at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in charge of the Handley facility, uh, the JM joke. Uh, so let me show you another nice picture and uh, where you see the Milky Way reflected in a lake and this, these are the things that any kid anywhere in the world, although most kids now in urban areas uh, unfortunately don't get to see this, I understand you can see it in Gauribindu to some extent, so I'll encourage all of you to go and visit it. But it's splendid, I mean for people who have had seen it, this is really amazing. Now these are stars and we understand these are very local, these are in our own galaxy, you know, what used to be called an island universe because we didn't know there were islands uh, uh, farther away. But let's look away from the belt in which most of our stars of the galaxy are. Into a faraway region, I couldn't get far, far away, but you look at a region where you don't see anything obvious and then look at it through the best telescopes you have. And this is what is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Okay, so Hubble Telescope, as most of you would know, uh, is one of the most capable uh, space telescopes, uh, and it peered at one region of the sky for a long period. And what you see here is galaxies all the way to as far as we can look. Okay, there are galaxies at very, uh, very large distances red shifts as we call it and so much so that light that is coming to us is from a time when the universe, when the galaxy was just barely forming. So some of the splotches that you see are actual galaxies but they look very ill-defined is because they are just forming. Right? They are not like uh, nearby galaxies which have nice spiral structures and all that. Okay, so we are immersed in a universe which is vast full of galaxies, okay? So I don't know how many of you, maybe all of you are too young to know about Space Odyssey or the book. And there, you know, this guy uh, peeks into a wormhole and says, oh my God, this is full of stars. So, you know, the, our universe is like that. When we have learned to peer around, it's full of galaxies. And if I were to take a tour through the universe, and uh, this is a, movie borrowed from the site of European Space Observatory, Southern Observatory, you can see if you do a flyby, there are galaxies and galaxies are kind of organized on a very interesting network. It's not a you know, regular lattice of galaxies, neither is it totally random, you know what you would say, there, there's no pattern to it. It's a very interesting pattern. So for many of you who are in condensed matter, soft condensed matter, this, you see it on your pet dishes and little systems. And these would be very complex phenomena, right? So I have 
always of the opinion, although I am not a great historian of uh, science, not at all in fact. So I used to wonder that suppose we were to start cosmology today, not 100 years back. Okay, actually I think we would not have uh, had the success we had because we would have been confronted by the complexity first and you know maybe struggled a lot more. So we did not and uh, we now are in a position where we, sorry, this yeah, where we know the entire history of the universe in a very robust as well as reliable fashion, in a quantitative fashion. What I mean by uh, reliable is, you know, we can give you numbers, but within a framework. And I would like to tell you in my talk here what the current framework we have for understanding the universe, what remains to be understood, and, you know, sort of try to convince you that that's been immense progress. Okay. This model that we had was one of the earliest models, you know, when we learned that gravitation could be applied to the scales of the universe in a reliable way. Uh, Newtonian gravity could not, right? So then we got into this thing where, you know, this 10 to the minus 32 seconds, I leave it at that, but anything from here to here is based on lab tested physics. Okay, that's amazing. The universe seems to obey the same physical laws that we see on the ground here, right, in your labs, in, in LFC. And then depending on how much you believe what we know about the earlier history and highest energies of uh, physical interactions, you can push yourself back. So some people would say, oh, we know everything up to here, someone will say here. But broadly, there's an immense 14 million years minus some 10 to the minus 32 seconds or 10 to the 16 seconds that we may have some speculative ideas. Rest of it is physics that you know many of you here work on. There are experts in our uh, institute who know many aspect, uh, you know, aspects of it. So what really allowed us to do cosmology is with the modern observations, but this is already 1970, not modern at all, uh, Lake Observatory Survey where we did not really look at the entire network of galaxies. We didn't have the ability to do so. Uh, but we could map the galaxies as they are on the sky. Right? And that's the easiest thing to do. You don't have to find the distance to the galaxy to make the 3D thing. And what really leaps out approximately is that no area of the sky looks to be specially endowed with galaxies or devoid of galaxies. Now, of course, you would see kind of patchy pattern. But remember, we are in the 1970s and we are looking at a broad picture. So people with glasses like me and, you know, bad enough eyes, just take off your glasses and look at it. It looks like a very wide patch here and a wide patch here. It's not the full sky because in those days we couldn't peer through the galactic plane as well as we can do now. Okay. But this is a, you know, amazing picture to me. This is features in people's uh, textbook. And I always look at it and say, look, this is what told you that there are simplifying assumptions we can make of the universe. And what's the major simplifying of assumption? That at least to the extent that we can make out in any solid angle that you look or any direction that you look, you know, the distribution of galaxies is on the average the same. You go project it all back. It, there's nothing special about one part versus other. And then you have to do something which we do uh, in science, which is have a have a basic principle. Like, you know, there are these, they have fancy names. But uh, the idea that we are human, as human beings, do not occupy a special part, place in the universe. This we learned the hard way with Copernican uh, revolution. And uh, that we were not at the center of the universe. We are revolving around a very mediocre star in a mediocre galaxy. Uh, later, we realized it was a star in a... But you now say that our galaxy is nothing special. So if this is what we see, roughly this is what anyone in any distant galaxy would see around us. And then it's mathematics. If you have a medium which is isotropic at all points, it is homogeneous. It's a mathematical theorem. It doesn't go the other way for young people. 
I would uh, encourage you to think of, uh, you know, counter examples the other way. So many logical statements go one way, and often people narrate it the opposite way, and you know, even in science or administration everywhere. So that you should be very careful about. This so basic thing is isolated around every point implies homogeneity, and this is encapsulated, as I said, in something grand called the cosmological principle, and this was propounded. Uh, you know, a century back, right? Uh, so there was uh, in the early 1900s, it was already, uh, you know, something that was used to build models based on this, at that time, very new theory of gravitation given by Einstein. And people came out with a big surprise that if you did that, you had to contend with an expanding universe. Okay, so smooth expanding cosmos, cosmos. It could be also smooth cos contracting cosmos, but uh, there were observations which indicated that we were in that branch where it was expanding or branch observations. So the basic framework of cosmology is very simple. There is a three-dimensional space-time, the spatial surface at any time, and that spatial surface can be thought of like a fabric or a magical kind of membrane that can expand and essentially space expands so things even embedded in space at the same location in space their physical distance keeps changing and when we see the universe expanding it is that picture that you should carry in mind and then it has expansion history which tells you how much expansion happened at what time and in the early days, we knew there was a whole family of solutions to this. And we also realized something very interesting, that the equations are so simple that it's an algebraic equation. If you tell me the current content of the universe and its nature, then I can tell, and also the expansion rate now, you can figure out what the universe did in the past and would do in the future. It's very deterministic within this framework. But we didn't know these numbers. When I started cosmology, these numbers were very poorly known. The expansion rate itself, which is called the Hubble constant, was known to a factor of two. People fought to death over it. And uh, But now, what is interesting, oh, I don't have that, but we know which solution we rely on with fairly high confidence. That's because we figured all this out here. This equation doesn't give you room for anything else. Okay, so just uh, to recap, so Einstein's relativity, which is the Einstein's gravitation theory of gravitation, applied to uniform distribution of matter, which is what the cosmological principle says, leads naturally to an expanding universe. There's no, you know, we are not doing any trick here. That's one of the solutions. It could be also contracting, as I said, but that's a time reversal kind of thing, but you don't really see that now. I wanted to emphasize that often expanding universe is you know, depicted or not necessarily uh, meant to be depicted that way, but you know, in BBC serials and all, when they talk about Big Bang, you hear a roar and gas you know, going out. To me, any, for any kid, if I was a kid, I would imagine an explosion happening. This is not an explosion. Okay? It is basically this quaint phenomena that theory of gravitation allows. Because theory of gravitation uh, that Einstein propounded made space-time dynamical. And if I look at it like spatial three-dimensional surfaces evolving in time, then uh, you would find that uh, this uh, spatial hypersurface at different times, the galaxies just seem to be moving apart from each other. And it doesn't depend on where you are. To this galaxy, everyone else is running away. This galaxy, everyone else is running away. And there are a lot of phenomena. The, you know, I, I'm teaching a cosmology course now to ISL kids. And the half, first half was just to get this through. This is all that is different in cosmology. Rest of it is basic physics applied to the expanding arena. And it has these interesting effects. Like if you see the shell of light, you can almost visually see that it just seems to be struggling to get far. And in fact, you can have expansion rates uh, so high that this light shell would freeze. 
you know, you can't reach some galaxies. All, all, everything is possible, right? Uh, so let me tell you what is relevant for the thing that I will, uh, you know, cover here. There are two things to keep in mind. Now imagine I mark out a hypothetical volume in the universe, you know, in this distribution of galaxies. Is it? Something is ringing, right? No, no. There's a feedback. It's perhaps the the space microphone. No, no, it's off. Uh, so uh, this volume. If I were to look at this volume back in time, we are in expanding universe. So there are number of galaxies in this volume. Uh, there is no reason. To, I mean broadly for lots of galaxies to emerge or disappear. So you will have the same number of volume going back, uh, number of galaxies in the volume in the time going back. So when the universe was half its size in terms of relative scale factor, we would have eight times the number density and eight times the energy density using E equal to MC square. One fourth, it's 64. The crucial thing is what about uh, Cos, you know, cosmic radiation background, which is kind of, uh, you know, there everywhere. There, the phenomena is a bit different, okay? As you go back in time, number of photons are the same, you know, photon density, uh, not density, photons in this volume are the same. Photon density will grow like, exactly like the galaxy density going back in time. But each photon, uh, because it's an adiabatic expansion, the wavelength halves which means frequency doubles, the energy associated with each frequency, each photon doubles. So instead of uh, a number density is, goes up by a factor of 8, but you see energy density is going by a factor of 16. Going back, you know, 64, 64, but 64, 128. So you see that radiation going back in time is getting, move, you know, growing in energy uh, density much faster than uh, matter density. While technically matter density, when I use the word matter, I'm talking about non relativistic stuff. And when I'm talking about radiation, I'm talking about relativistic stuff. But that's really relevant only for the experts in the audience of the students. Okay? Uh, so you go back, what does it tell you? That there must be an epoch when the universe, the scale factor was large enough that the universe was totally radiation dominated. At this point, we know what the radiation content of the universe is, as I'll get to. And given that, we know that about when the universe is over 10,000 times smaller, you know, all these scales. You know, for a all time before that, the radiation dom density dominated the universe. So you're in a very, very interesting situation. Right? That early universe is very easy. I told you there's this model and you need to know what, what dominates the energy density at that time. And it's largely, I mean, it's almost uh, radiation dominated. Not almost, it is radiation dominated. In uh, the early universe is radiation dominated. Well, the question is, that tells you that the radiation path in the universe is extremely important, right? Because the entire, most of the history of the universe, if you compute, was radiation dominated in cosmic time. Okay, and where is this radiation? And that was an amazing breakthrough. So in 1965, very serendipitously, uh, there was a telescope being set up in Bell Labs, which detected an excess noise which they couldn't understand. And finally, after doing everything that radio astronomers do to clean up the noise, uh, someone told them, hey, but there are this bunch of people very close by in Princeton who seem to be looking for a cosmological signal, which is essentially going to be a noise. Right, excess noise. And then they talk to each other, and uh, rest is history. I mean, Penzias and Wilson discovered uh, the cosmic microwave background. And, you know, if this cosmic part came because of Princeton, I should also say that it was amazingly nice of the Princeton group, uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, the senior leader there, not to force himself on the paper, but the interpretation of cosmic was largely because of the cosmology team, right? And you know the statement he made is, "Guys, we have been scooped." So he accepted that they had seen this path that they were looking for. And what you had discovered 
is the dominant radiation content of the universe. 99% of the radiation content of the universe is accounted for in this bath. Okay? It's an extremely isotropic bath which sort of lends a huge support to the isotropy that we are talking about in terms of galaxy distribution. So there you don't have to take off your glasses. I mean, none of you are capable of detecting uh, differences at the level of 10 to our minus 5 if I give you this map of the CMD sky in Kelvin. And this thing is glowing as a black body, which has immense uh, implications and has a temperature which is very well measured now in the fourth decimal, third decimal point. Okay? And this is the clinching support for hot big bang model. Okay? Okay, so let's see what has happened. So when we look out in the sky, and if you look further away, when you're seeing a distant galaxy, you're looking at it in the past. So you should realize that naturally, because things cannot travel faster than light, we are in a time machine. As we look for peer further down uh, in distance, uh, further out in distance, we are also looking back in time. We, you know, technically we are looking back on a light hole. And uh, so, if for any observer in the universe, when they look back, they'll see galaxies and stuff and stuff here, and then nothing for a period, and then a plasma screen which is glowing. Okay, if you go and put a thermometer there, you would find that the plasma screen is at a temperature of about 3,300 Kelvin. It's very hot plasma. Not very hot, but hot plasma. But then because of the expansion of the universe, what you see here are photons with that distribution at a temperature of 3000. So 3300 divided by 3 you know, is 1100. The universe here is 1100 times you know, smaller in scale factor. Everything is physically 1100 times smaller on this surface. But it's amazing. Nature has a transparent window to a time of the when the universe was only half a million years old. And remember, the current age is 14 billion years. Okay. And for people outside this audience, you know, we use this giga years and giga and all these. These are basically short forms of billion and stuff like that. And the universe in this window is totally transparent, except for things, uh, details, but largely that's true. And the universe beyond that is a totally opaque wall. It's like we hit a fog wall as we look out in the universe. And it surrounds every observer. Now, you might think, you know, is there a physically a thing all around us, like a shell? It's not a shell in time, uh, in space. It's a shell in space time. Okay, so it is a shell in space, but we see it all around us because it is coming from an epoch back in time, if you look at this light hole. This is conformal time and, you know, co-moving uh, space. And you would see that this, uh, there's a radius. So when you go back to the hypersurface, which was 1100 times smaller, uh, when the universe is half a million years old, this is 14 billion years old. You, you know, you can't peer with electromagnetic uh, probes beyond the surface because beyond that, the thing is a plasma and plasma scatters light so much that you don't get coherent information. See, one thing you should realize is when you say you can't see in the fog, it's not as if nothing is happening or there's no information beyond it. There is information. But the information is so scrambled that you only see the photosphere. Like in this, on the surface of the sun, what we see is the photosphere, right? And, you know, so there's this whole history of the universe beyond that hidden here. But this, in terms of distance, is only the last 3% of as far as you can look in the universe. So this probe, for example, uh, in particular, is probing the uh, his, uh, this, uh, volume of observable or volume of the universe to as far as you can really look, only the last 3%. But last 3% is very exciting. Why is that? Because not only is this bath isotropic, very isotropic, but I told you it's only at the level of 10 parts per million. Okay? It has also revealed signatures of little fluctuations. 
in the temperature of the microwave background. And this happened in 1992. And that explains for you the structure we see in the distribution of galaxies. We see very well correlated structures. These again technically are random, but they are correlated random fields. Right? And that is kind of uh, very important in what we deduce. And in any typical volume of the universe, it's full of galaxies. And you know, this is from a real data of a two degree field. I forgot to refer to it here. Uh, it's now relatively old. Uh, but what you see are these galaxies with their colors uh, re reflected. And this milky thing was put just to you know, guide your eye to see that there is a rich cellular structure. Okay? But you should also realize that around each of these galaxies or all, there is a dark matter distribution, which doesn't look like exactly like this, but it's good for our first thought. Okay, now what do we have? We have this plasma screen, where what is being played out is the universe when it was half a million years old. Okay, and what is being played out is essentially the origin of structures. We know that there is some high energy physics phenomena which uh, very magically is actually quantum uh, for people in the lamp group probably. So we believe that that phenomena is what created this perturbation, which we can't see here, but we can see at this end of the plasma. And this is carrying information of this and also the entire history of the universe here because the photons propagate through this history. So it's an amazing screen where we believe that what we see as uh, for, you know, fluctuations at the level of 10 parts per million have grown to fluctuations of order unity or more uh, to form this bridge structure that we see here. But that is one part of the story which we have unraveled to understand our universe very well. But for the next generation, the challenge is to connect this. Right? What was the origin of structures? Okay. So let me go over it again, 3 Kelvin temperature. The temperature fluctuation is at 70 micro Kelvin. Okay. And uh, I will only, there's also a polarization pattern, which I'll only get to briefly later, uh, but not get into details. What is being played out is amazing. It's very basic physics. So if you look at the plasma screen, there's something which has excited it. Right, just like you know, a lake which is being excited by some phenomena, like right? you know, something happens at the bottom of the lake, and you see ripples at the top of the lake. You can't see what is happening at the bottom, right? But we can, as physicists, analyze it with tools that not too many areas of science have. Uh, we can go and look at it as a more technically green function, but we can decompose the fluctuations into as if they were delta, you know, they are localized spike fluctuations that I'm putting on the plasma. Now this is not only physics. If you have uh, been at any music concert, uh, Hindustani or Carnatic, you would see the percussionist actually tune the tabla or, you know, midangam or whatever. And what do they do? You would see they have a hammer and they hit it. Okay? That is essentially what you call Green's function. So they are looking at the response to a impulse. Okay? That in engineering is impulse and the response function. If through phases, it's a Green function. And let's do that. So in this plasma, at some point, we create a spike of all the densities that are there and ask what will happen. Now, what are we? You know, what is the universe consisting of? You know. It has uh, baryons we are made of. We know it's at about 4%, right? We know it very precisely. But then we have cold dark matter, which does not interact with the left magnetism, which accounts for up to 25%. And then rest of it is some weird thing we will talk about later. OK? Uh, that's uh, dark energy, right? So anything we don't know, we call it dark, and that's it. Uh, but what you see here is amazing that you have this ripple which goes out in the baryons which are tightly coupled to the radiation. Baryons are ordinary atoms, so they are ionized atoms and so through the electron they are tightly coupled to the radiation bar. 
and they behave like elastic fluid and they are the ones which show this ripple, only the barrier refraction. And this ripple goes out to a particular distance and you can see that when the color changes from red to green, it freezes. That's when the universe turns from ionized to neutral, that's the edge of this plasma screen. And essentially, this phenomena cannot happen because the atoms have lost their coupling to the radiation, so it's not an elastic system at all. There's no perturbation at all. So it freezes to a particular size. We know how to calculate that size. It's just the sound horizon in this very simple universe. Okay, and it is 150 megaparsec. And it's a characteristic scale which is imprinted on the same sky. Okay? We know the physics very well. I'm not I'm just to convince you that you know all this is very basic physics applied to an expanding universe and there is very little ambiguity in this. I mean, there is also very little space to do anything more. Uh, and this is worked out, we understand every bit of what you would see if I Fourier transform this and look at its spectrum. But the question is, how well can we map it? So Kobe saw it with really bad glasses, right? So you could make out that there were fluctuations, but you could resolve only a few de 10 degree kind of uh, resolution. Then in the next decade came uh, Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe. And Wilkinson uh, microwave and isotropy probe saw the same thing, but at a much better angular resolution. And then the next decade, there was Planck, and this is from NASA, this is from ESA, the European Space Agency, and it has the best measurements till date. It has mapped out the intensity fluctuations to the level that you can get. I mean, there's really, for most of the measurements they have given out, you can't expect to improve any further. And I should also mention that while people talk about the history of cosmic micro background observations in terms of these three eras, uh, there were lots of ground-based observatories, you know, like we have, uh, which did phenomenal work. First polarization pattern was uh, detected by DAISY, uh, which is a radio interferometer, just like, uh, you know, many of you see in your, uh, you know, in, in the context here. And then there are really, really uh, wonderful experiments which are now running and there will be a next generation stuff happening there. So let me briefly mention what did we see in Planck. So the Planck gave out a map. This is the full sky, I mean, again for the audience beyond, uh, mapped onto this oval. This is what astronomers do. And on that sky, you have mapped out the what you are seeing as intensity fluctuation on this plasma screen. This plasma screen is mapped onto this. You see hotter spots in red and colder regions in blue. The range of fluctuations there is 300 microfilaments to uh, my, plus minus 300 microfilaments. RMS is typically about 70 microfilaments of this. Okay, and see this plaque allowed for the first time to for us to see this uh, screen, uh, this map without the galaxy masking any part of it, okay, fairly reliably. And it, if you take those ripples, see what is happening is I broke up the perturbations earlier in terms of impulses and the response of to impulses. These are equivalent pictures. I can do Fourier transform and also do that. If I do a Fourier transform, this is the Fourier spectrum on the, on the sky map. And Planck, uh, Kobe just measured this part. W map did up to here, right? Uh, maybe here or there. I mean, I don't want to fight over it. I mean, but uh, uh, we were plan part of Planck, and you can see that we can see this uh, Fourier domain uh, resonant feature going up to the eighth peak. Okay, you can resolve up to eight peaks here, and these peaks are essentially acoustic peaks, uh, phenomena that you see in a resonance tube. Okay, if you have a resonance tube experiment, you know that uh, you know there's standing waves, and then there are harmonics. So this is the first harmonics. This is the second harmonic, third harmonic going on like that, right? So it's amazing. And uh, so then now you start questioning: Is this phenomena really happening? 
or is it because we had this data and we were fitting it to this kind of models? This red one is the expected prediction within the isotropic and homogeneous universe models that I told you. Given all the parameters, you vary them, but there's one that fits. And then, essentially, uh, you might ask the question, what we fear missing something because we already have limited the kind of curves that we are fitting to the data. So we did a totally non-parametric analysis and showed the following. I mean, there were other things shown, but one thing we showed this is this harmonic pattern, right? This is peak number one versus peak i versus ith peak versus location of the jth peak, and you can see it, you know, lines up like you would expect a spectrum of from an X-ray spectrum of crystal. Okay, so even if people did not know anything about the you know the isotropic and homogeneous universe and all the physics, any smart scientist given this data would see that there is something interesting. There is some kind of a resonant phenomena uh, involved here. And given the information we have in Planck, uh, we know what the universe consists of and its expansion rate to extraordinary accuracies. Okay, and this is where we are really, you know, shoulder to shoulder with particle physics. And interestingly, just like there's a particle data group list of particle masses, nowadays they have also, you know, similar thing for cosmological parameters. Although we are not at that same level in terms of, uh, I would say, accuracy, but precision-wise we are there. It's one percent in our baryon density, two percent in cold dark matter density, and this is the best measured uh, parameter, which is the size of that ring, right? Angular size of the ring. We know the physical size is 150 megaparsec, but angular size, its subtense is one of the best measured parameters. And then we know certain things about the primordial fluctuations and the rate of expansion of the universe. And this all can be fit within a very simple variant of this model that we were talking about. And that's why we started calling, you know, people have started calling it the standard cosmological model. It's a six parameter model which fits everything that we see till now. Okay, uh, uh, at least definitely Planck. And the person who was one of the architects of that was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize. I mean, this is my guess. I don't know whether the Nobel, how the Nobel Committee thought about it, but he was someone who could have got it anywhere in the earlier decades, uh, Jim Peebles. But I feel that once Planck brought out these things with such robustness, uh, you know, he was the person who was one of the chief, I mean, it's not the only person working on it, but he actually propounded some of the key ideas. And he's one of the ones who is the most uneasy about the cosmology, you know, fact of saying that, oh, this is cosmology and that's it, we know everything about the universe. He says it's very uneasy because, you know, it's a simple model, it seems to work, that's a great surprise, but it need not have worked. So it's a simple model, but yet an exotic universe. Because 95, we are forced to admit that 95% of the energy density of the universe is in some exotic form. We haven't seen it in the lab yet. Okay? Part of it is cold dark matter. We cannot see it directly, but we only infer its existence through gravitational interactions. Then, there is something weird, which is dark energy. I am of the camp where I, at this point in proved otherwise, I would say it's a it's a new constant, fundamental constant, called the cosmological constant, which behaves like a dark, smooth form of energy, which reacts repulsively in the, you know, in a Newtonian picture, against uh, under gravity. But most importantly, uh, these are all important areas to go. With. But what I'll go forward with is the fact that all these inferences have been made, assuming there was this hammer which was on that other side of the plasma screen creating these perturbations, which tells you that there is ultra high energy physics, possibly of a fundamental nature, that we don't understand because we don't have a the mechanism. We have a broad range of a broad paradigm under which these mechanisms work, but we don't have the mechanism. But the rest of it, all the deductions of those numbers are very, very robustly done. Okay? 
So the paradigm of CMB fluctuations, acoustic phenomena, this has been made by you know uh, other things, things other than the plot I showed you earlier with this uh, non-parametric thing. The most uh, definitive thing is this ring being seen in the polarization pattern. So this is plant data, and if you stack up the polarization around hot spots, uh, hot intensity spots, the polarization has a particular pattern. Polarization actually maps the velocity field, and you can clearly see the ring, right? And this is what you would have, this is a simulation. So it's as good as simulation, and this is something that we go into textbooks. I mean, this is an amazing uh, confirmation of something that was called Sakhar approximations, then, you know, Peebles and Liu uh, talked about it, and there was, you know, great people talking about it. Similarly, uh, this is hot spots. You can line up the cold spots, and you see that the velocity pattern has reversed itself, where whatever was red in the velocity is blue. I mean, this tells you the radial direction. Uh, the thing has reversed. What was red is blue. What is blue is red. If you have questions, I can get into this a little more. This is to do with the polarization. Then, we also, I also told you that we believe these tiny fluctuations that I'm seeing at this plasma screen are what grew to the last structure. And then, how do, well, do we know that? We have this picture that this CMB map is the blueprint from which these grew. And if this is correct, then of course we are in a great place in physics. We know the initial condition and the final state, initial state, final state, we know a mechanism and it has some dials. And you dial it right so that it matches. That is what we have done, right? So we know these parameters so well because we have a consistent picture going from there. But you have to ask, is this correct? No, is the mechanism really the one? And that we have confirmed to something called Dryerian acoustic oxidations. If you look at uh, distribution of galaxies and look at the polarization function, Normally it just falls off a distance, but there's a tiny bump corresponding to the same ripple that I was talking about because baryons got dragged with it. Okay. Similarly, since there is intervening last scale structure which is growing in a particular fashion, it distorts the bundle of CMB light that is coming, it shears it, and we measure it as a something called CMB weak lensing. And those measurements have gone very well. I don't really get into it. It's a very subtle effect. Only Plank could see it. You can see this is the difference it makes if you have the lensing effect or not, don't have the lensing effect. Nevertheless, Planck could detect it and could make a map of the integrated mass density along line of sight. It's a very preliminary map. This is where we can improve a huge lot with future things. But nevertheless, we have just started. It's like the Kobe map uh, for CAB fluctuations. So we are broadly in a situation where we understand cosmology in this part of the drawing, where there's a homogeneous and isotropic patch of the universe. And given that, given those conditions, we know how the universe would have evolved. But it could have evolved from something really exotic. We won't know till we go further. And there's a huge discovery space. Okay, and uh, how will it be with time? Few more minutes. Okay. Great. So then let me sketch out one particular direction in of many directions you can look at. You can look at cosmic topology, you can look at all kinds of things here because all of them may leave a subtle effect. You know, you must have seen papers of multiverses colliding with each other. They're rather unlikely. But we have to take steps towards observing the early universe. This step between what created the perturbations and the perturbations we see in the microscope. So this is the picture. So we, this is the cosmic screen. And we have understood everything we did from translating this picture to this picture, connecting these two pictures. But we need to still do this. We have a fairly good idea or paradigm within which to work. There is a concept of inflation, which is necessary for various reasons. Uh, to have something, you know, you may not call it inflation, but whatever you call it, it has to do a certain number of things. And associated with the will be quantum fluctuations that you can very reliably calculate in with quantum field theory on curved space time. Those results are as robust as your belief that there is Hawking radiation. Okay? With that, 
your picture will be complete. But how far have you gone there? So inflation paradigm, you know, naturally gives you a homogeneous isotropic patch of the universe, large enough patch where our cosmology polarity can be played out. Okay, that's the cosmological principle. It's consistent. It also predicts for you that the geometry of the universe is, you know, flat. The geometry or spatial geometry of the three-dimensional surfaces is Euclidean. We have got that. Now we have also confirmed that there are perturbations because you know, we see them in the microwave background fluctuations. They are of a nature which is naturally emerges out of generate models of inflation. They, of course, the density perturbations are what we have seen. They are of a nature with no entropy fluctuation associated. We know that very well, up to 5% possibility. Like, you know, if there are non adiabatic fluctuation, non you know, entropy violating fluctuation, then they have to be less than 5%. And the underlying statistics is Gaussian. The only major, major thing that will really, you know, say that we are right, and this will a fairy tale come true, is to see the gravitational waves from this early phase. Because just like density perturbations are created, the same physics generates for you. It's exactly the same physics. You can't avoid having a gravitational wave pattern. The question is that what is what is the level of that? And model to model that will vary. So we you know parameterize it very simply with the ratio of gravitational wave to density perturbation amplitudes, right? And that is given by a number called R, just R, for whatever reason. This connects to the energy scale at which the physics that was causing, it has caused inflation or had caused inflation would be related. And currently, our bounds, conservative is 0 0.07, but actually 0 0.03 or something. We are, we are really pushing very hard on that boundary. But we have not seen anything except for a false alarm that we had from Bison. It's a 2-2 and bus 2 for cosmology. And a big community of us think that it has to be done with another space to own uh, mission. Okay? Because there are limitations to pursuing for ground. US has a huge program to do that. Uh, but there were many, many um, proposals which are still awaiting thing. One of them which has gone forward to some extent is the light bird proposal of uh, Japanese guys who will work with ESA and NASA to do that. Uh, we will see, but they have in the low resolution band, so it's a bit uh, less satisfactory. So in 2018, uh, Cosmology Consortium called Sebi Bharatiya, uh, it was set up, largely driven by this goal. Uh, to propose to ISRO uh, absolutely do it all kind of a mission. We will map out the CMB sky such that we don't, won't have much more in terms of the fluctuations to worry about. There will be more in terms of the spectral nature, but it will make the first steps in the spectral science also. I won't go over the details here, but uh, it's a very comprehensive, uh, so the mayor ultimate polarization survey. The ultra high goal or scientific promise that is the big carrot is that we may see this primordial gravitation wave background. If you don't see it, it spells very serious trouble for the paradigm because you have to switch to another class within it. Okay? It is gravitational waves of quantum nature. Remember LIGO detected gravitational waves but they are classical. These gravitational waves are generated by quantum fluctuations. We know that. So it's, it's kind of a Nobel Prize kind of uh, goal. Okay, and if you were to listen carefully at the Nobel lectures of Rainer Weiss and Kip Thorne, when they received the Nobel Prize, you will see both of them mention the next big thing they would look forward to is this. Then we see the primordial gravitation waves. And then in doing so, we have to have a satellite which will do a lot more. You know, in neutrino physics, uh, map all the dark matter, you know, that map I showed you now from Planck is like the early days. You can just get maps which are much, much finer than that. And it's huge legacy of astrophysical data sets. And of course, with anything where you stretch beyond, there's a unexpected discovery space. So the plan 
we put forward is to have a satellite with uh, dimensions of about 4 meters diameter, 4 meters high, because it fits into a GSLV Mark III. We we'll launch it to the second Lagrange point. We will point away from the sun and map the CAP sky over a few years, right? It's not uncharted territory, largely. The Planck satellite was the coolest satellite in space. It had a cryogenic detection system and, you know, uh, had all the challenges that we have with that. And these are solved problems and it also went well too. What changes here is we will be breaching the capability in terms of the detectors and the ability to measure power, you know, small amounts of power. So normally when daily experience you talk about megawatt uh, or, you know, milliwatts, lasers, power plants. And then, um, many of you may not know, the FM ra radiation that gets to your uh, FM radio is actually, the detector is very good. It detects nanowatts of power. Your cell phone detects about picowatts of power. But we need detectors that can detect attowatts of power. And even then, we have to line them up in huge arrays to achieve what we want. And these detectors work at 0.1 uh, Kelvin, right? So they are really, really uh, uh, cold, right? And it's a challenge to maintain from this solar panel, which is a 300 Kelvin, to this detector plane, uh, temperature gradient such that this is at milli Kelvin and this is at 300 Kelvin. And there are various designs that we put forward, more ambitious one here. And I'll stop with this picture. So 10 years back, you know, we made transformation in our understanding of the cosmology and transformation in with robustness and accuracy with precision with which we know cosmology with this Planck satellite, which was launched in 2009. And I'm hoping that there will be a CMB mission where India will play a big role, possibly launched by ISRO. And, but this is still some at the stage where this is a concept we have put forward and is being evaluated. Thank you. I'll stop there. Because they are, you know, entropy conserving, they are best interpreted as a different expansion rate uh, history. So, you know, there's an overall expansion rate which is the average expansion that's happening, mm -hmm. but there is a fluctuation to that. And these density fluctuations, the source is this little deviations from the expansion history at different regions of the sky. Yes, yes it's true. These are exp um, what you're seeing here is this is redder and bluer, and uh, particularly on the long, uh, larger angular scales, precisely because that patch of the universe expanded by a little more or little less. Yes, so that would be normal way of interpreting that. Yeah, but we, we know that that is true. But then can it not be all of these instead of... Uh, no, it's all, all of it. So what is happening is on large scales, that is the source. But on small scales, physical effects take over. So this is the, this is what causes the fluctuation. But then there is matter which can respond to it, matter and radiation, and then set up these ripples and stuff like that. So that is basic physics. But what has excited that driving mechanism, all that it's doing, is essentially creating tiny differences in the expansion history, uh, you know, as 
so your expansion at some place is sub 10 to 5 minus 5 less or more than the average. So if you have come up with this idea 20 years back, you know, that would have been great. Yeah, so it depends on how you want to look at it. Okay, in the Newtonian picture, the mass is attracting light. And there was during Newtonian Newton's time question of whether a massless photon, you know, with Newtonian gravity, whether it will bend or not. It doesn't really bend that much, and Einstein actually got that factor wrong initially in his prediction. Uh, this, this is best understood as, uh, you know, gravitation lensing where basically the uh, space through which the photon is coming is not flat. So the straight line is not a straight line that we understand. Like, you know, a straight line on a sphere is actually one of your longitudes. It's definitely not flat, right? Two longitudes go and, you know, intersect at the poles. That is what is happening uh, in this. So these things are coming back and going away. Precisely because of that. Questions? Hi, sir. Uh, so, I had a question from a theoretical standpoint that in, uh, in one of your slides you showed a map of the Lambda City model. Yes, yes, this one. So, the uh, uh, model that you are using is Planck CT plus Rho T plus Planck CT. Can you please? Uh, Sorry? What, uh, that, uh, uh, Model you are using, no? These are the six parameters we constrain. So, plant T plus low T plus density, that one. On the second uh, column, the header. This one? The header of the second column. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what is that? This is the model, right? No, no. Okay. This is the data. This is the okay. plant temperature. Temperature means intensity fluctuation information. Uh, we did uh, measure polarization in plant. I see. Uh, so, it is used. But then, there, with that, as well as other uh, data sets, where we have measured polarization at higher re angular resolution. Polarization signal is seen in some polarization signal. I mean, weak lensing signal. So, lensing causes polarization, which we have also measured. So, all that put together is the data set we have used to get to these constraints. So now, there are other combinations of data sets you can use. And largely, they are consistent. Within Erebus. And those parameters are the standard uh, lambda CDM model. These are lam lambda CDM models. It's just written in a different fashion. It's um, it's cut out from a technical document. But this is the baryonic density yeah. multiplied by the Hubble parameter square. This is the physical baryonic density. This is the physical cold dark matter density. And omega means it's the density relative to the critical density. What we call the critical density. And that I, I actually like to call it the characteristic density. That's the characteristic density of the universe. This, I said, is um, the size of that, angular size of that ring. This translates to many other real parameters. But it's a combination of various things that are uh, measured by this. This is something to do with the epoch of realization and the opacity. And you know, there's an expert right here uh, who can tell you more about it. Uh, it's basically tells you 7% of the photons are not really totally coming transparently. They have had an interaction in between. Okay? This is the amplitude of the per per parameter perturbation. This is the spectral slope of the parameter perturbation. That's all I need. Rest of it are derived parameters. And uh, one other thing, just uh, information. Uh, so through, uh, through this LIGO detection, uh, are this, uh, is this uh, uh, cold dark matter component has been also confirmed through observation? Not directly, we cannot see it obviously, but in you, uh, one of your slides you, sh uh, so you told that this uh, cold dark matter that we have uh, is being confirmed through gravitational wave detection. Is it? Uh, no, no, I, I said gravitational lensing. Sorry, gravitational lensing, yes. Yeah, lensing is different from gravitational waves. Yes, yes. But since you brought up LIGO, LIGO uh, detections or this gravitational wave astronomy, will allow us to probe the dark energy sector. See, I didn't mention how much is the dark energy. That's because of that uh, algebraic relation. 
I give you two of the numbers, three numbers add up to one. I have given you two of the numbers. So if you are not, you know, someone who has not done a standard three or four of mathematics, you would know how to get the dark energy. Yeah, so I had actually... You need a mic because it's ringing. Oh, Thanks. Uh, so I had actually a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is about the dark matter. What is the... So given that most of the dark matter candidate direct experiments have actually not measured whatever they were looking for. Uh, is it, uh, so what remains? And are there new ideas on what this dark matter compri is comprised of? Okay, so dark matter searches, which is another, another amazing piece of frontier physics, uh, frontier experimental physics, is very, very strongly constrained. And you know, the driven space for theorists is reduced so much, right, which is what you're referring to. No, it is ruling out uh, dark matter in the most obvious things that you thought could be dark matter candidates. Uh, there are, of course, theorists are theorists. Uh, there are lots of things to rule out. One of the things are very light, axionic dark matter, which may not be ruled out uh, through these direct searches because they depend on a heavy thing knocking a nucleus in one of the crystals that you guys know better than me. Okay, and looking for phonons coming out of that. But uh, there is also axions which can be looked at through some electromagnetic coupling. And there are huge solenoids in which they are looking for it. Um, that's also another area. But uh, no, we are very uncomfortable. The unknowns are really tough. And which is where, you know, um, people keep saying that yes, it works very well, but don't get so, you know, so much in love with that that you expect that there will be a particular dark matter and a, you know, dark energy field, okay? So, I don't think he has too much against the cosmological constant. I think cosmological constant for now is a good backup. I'm unless proved of it. But the dark matter, truly, we are, we are struggling. So, just follow up. Uh, so, the LIGO experiment has now uh, kind of uh, done a lot of uh, observations on colliding black holes. Do we now have, for instance, a an idea of what the black hole number density and mass distribution is? And could that, at some level, be a substitute or that is just compact and it will not work? That's very recent, yes. So there has been somehow the, okay. High energy physicists created a huge thing of, oh, it must be one, of the lightest supersymmetric partner, right? Because they're in love with supersymmetry and that's what we lived with. It sort of shrouded the possibility that a lot of very senior people, I've had discussions with Ostriker when I was writing a review article with him. We don't, have not ruled out the fact that the entire dark matter is black holes, are black holes, okay? Because black holes, again, they have satisfied all the things. They are only gravitationally thing, you won't see any light emitted from them if they're Know, not in many environment. This is could be primordial black holes, and that has also come to fore because of the black holes that we have detected. So I gave a talk two days back, and I showed uh, the audience that all the black holes that LIGO has detected is very distinct population from all the black holes we knew existed or inferred. I would say knew certainly from X-ray. Okay, so this is a certainly a different realm. And there are people working on this hypothesis. There are people also busy trying to rule it out. Uh, it's a very active area. Okay. Hey, uh, maybe you have already mentioned, but uh, you need some. Uh, uh, so, in Planck, uh, uh, for example, what kind of uh, Cryogenic temperature has been reached uh, using solar. It is not many Kelvin. The same temperature that was that is needed here. Okay. So it is not a challenge. The challenge was Planck's observation time was limited because uh, again for technical reasons. 
it is to bend helium. Okay, so we are losing helium until the helium, the cry cryogen exists, you know, was there. We could run the experiment and then the experiment should be closed off. So it was a two, supposed to be two years, but we went up to two and a half years. Uh, but that limitation we definitely want to remove because we have better ideas of uh, magnetically cooled cryogenic uh, things. Uh, again, there are many here who know much more about this than me. Okay. So by means of ATRs and uh, things like that. Sorry, you said something? 